Okay, John chapter 20. John chapter 20. At the end of his gospel, after the resurrection, and Easter was last week, after the resurrection, John counts three distinct occasions when Jesus appears to his disciples. Three distinct occasions when Jesus appears to his disciples. These were not his only post-resurrection appearances, because there are other Gospels that tell us other things. But John has made it clear, in verses 30 to 31 of this chapter of John 20, that what he does is he selects his material to make his point. He selects from historical events to make the points he's trying to convey under the inspiration of John as he writes this book. And here John seems to select three episodes of the resurrection, three occasions when various things happen within each of those occasions, to act as sort of witnesses to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, you know, in Jewish law, everything has to be established by the testimony of three witnesses. Here are John's, as it were, three testimonies to establish the rock-solid evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, three times. Three of it. So the first resurrection testimony in John runs from chapter 20, verses 1 to 23, on the first day of the Jewish week following the resurrection. We're dealing with that today. The first day of the week. The second testimony to the resurrection takes place exactly one week later. That's chapter 20, verses 24 to 31. As the resurrected Jesus catches up with Thomas amongst the twelve. And the final episode in, in John, the final testimonial episode, takes place during the resumption of fishing activities back up in Galilee, beside the Sea of Tiberias. And that's John 21, 1-25. So you see, John has got three testimonial episodes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Today we're looking at the first one, early on the first day of the week, it says. That first day of the week, John 21, 1-23. Now... That first event itself then takes place in three episodes. So we've got three testimonial events. And this episode, this first day of the week, there are three bits to it. Can you see how John's working with threes? He's working with those threes because everything must be established by the testimony of three witnesses, I'm suggesting to you. So here it goes. Three episodes on that first day of the week. Early morning, later morning, both in the garden at the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, then in the evening, somewhere else, behind closed doors, in the Jerusalem area. I think it's behind closed jaws in the Jerusalem, Jerusalem area, but you know what I mean. It's behind closed doors in the Jerusalem area. Please notice then, that first event, early morning, tomb side, verses 1 to 9. Jesus, having been crucified on the Friday, hurriedly buried before the, the Saturday started, on the Friday night in Jewish reckoning, by two brave men... Nicodemus, the Sanhedrin guy, and the wealthy man Joseph of Arimathea, who had a tomb ready to be used. Ready to be used for himself, but he's going to use it for the time being for Jesus, who's absolutely poor. Joseph is going to perform this pious act of charitably burying the poor, Jesus. So the Sabbath laws wouldn't be broken. He was quickly put in that tomb. And Mary then goes to the tomb at the first available opportunity after the Sabbath. The Lord's life appears to have been disastrously ended as far as she can see. His enemies appear to have won the day. But still, still, in the midst of disaster and disillusionment and despair, here comes Mary Magdalene at the earliest possible opportunity after the Sabbath, first light on the Sunday, to do whatever there is she might still be able to do for Jesus. However hopeless things appear, however dark and dangerous the days, and they were, it was risky. In life and in death, she's committed to Jesus, committed to his service, even if it's just to the corpse of Jesus in the tomb. She is committed to him, she is committed to his work, which she will persevere in doing. And she will go on serving Jesus, even when it very much looks as if the game is really up. Why? Why would that be? All is left, of course. Why would you do that? Okay, well, what do we know about her? <clears throat> Mary Magdalene offers. The name's Mary. And she was from Magdala. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, anything else we got on it? 
Caleb, go on. So in light of being like doing stuff with Jesus all the time, because mm. maybe she like liked him. She loved him, yeah. She was yeah. one of those women who went around looking after Jesus and the disciples. She was part of the throng, you know. And she was one of those women that Jesus taught, which was pretty dangerous and radical at the time. She's mentioned in each of the four Gospels in the New Testament. Uh, some people say she'd been a bad girl, she'd been a prostitute or a sinner of some sort, but it doesn't say that in the New Testament. At some point in, the, in history, Mary Magdalene became confused with two other women in the Bible, Mary the sister of Martha, and the unnamed sinner woman in, in Luke's Gospel, Luke 7, 36-50, who both of those actually washed Jesus' feet. With their hair and stuff, yeah? What we're told about Mary from Magdala is that the Lord had, Lord had driven seven demons out of her. That's what we know about her. Luke 8, 13. Setting her free from bondage to the forces of darkness. Satan that had previously afflicted her life. So why does that woman then show this dedication and commitment to Jesus? Where does the love come from? Jesus says in Luke 7, 47, of that woman washing his feet with her hair, he who is forgiven little loves little. He was forgiven much loves much. She's been richly blessed by God. She's been forgiven much. She's been delivered from the forces of darkness in a most striking way. And she loves him. She's conscious. Of how good God has been to her, how good Jesus has been to her. How he's noticed her and cherished her and given her love and care and delivered her from darkness and death. And when you've been forgiven much, you love much. But funnily enough, God has got better to give her than she expects as she sets out with a a basket of spices or whatever, to do the last decency, decency she can offer, offer to Jesus, the dead Jesus, the corpse of Jesus. And yet at first she seems frustrated even in that. The guard that had been set over the grave by the temple authorities vanished. Stone rolled away and she fears the absolute desolate worst. The grave has been robbed. And she runs off to find the other disciples. Peter and John, verses 3 to 9, then come running. Caleb. Why would people steal Jesus' body? All sorts of reasons. People did steal bodies for all sorts of strange purposes. Medical reasons? Don't know in those days. Don't know. Don't know. Um, there might be some attempt to, to interfere with the story of Jesus and the reliability of Jesus and whatever. There may be all sorts of things going on. Mary seems to have thought perhaps the gardener had moved the body out of the rich man's tomb, as if the offer had been withdrawn, as if, you know, we were poverty stricken, we got nowhere to put the body, okay, give it to me and I'll do something to respect it. But we don't know. They seem to think the grave's been robbed anyway, and Peter and John, verse 2, set out for the tomb. Now look, they set out running. They are obviously not Olympic athletes, and they're not going to get there too fast on the foot. But in spite of the fact that when Mary went and told them what had happened, they were a bit sceptical, you know, from the other Gospels, there was a certain amount of scepticism about her accounts all round. Nevertheless, they went off running, and speed is clearly on the minds of Peter and John, who got to check out this report, because John refers to it here in his Gospel, chapter 20, verse 3. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now, John is the other disciple. He is writing, and he's not mentioning his name. He's not making a great deal of himself in his account of the life of Jesus. So he is the other disciple. Or he is the disciple who Jesus loved, or whatever, throughout the gospel. Because he's not bigging himself up. So Peter and John run for the two. John was younger, apparently, and ran faster. Waited outside, didn't see all the detail inside. Peter turned up straight in. Peter caught up, dove straight into the tomb ahead of John. Did you get that bit about who goes in and who doesn't? It's very important. It's significant because the big revelation in this section is the thing about the grave clothes. Now here are the three testimonies to Jesus' resurrection we've been saying, okay? And then we've said there are these three parts of the first one, the first day of the week. The big thing about this first one is the grave clothes. 
See, <clears throat> don't get it like this. What we're envisaging here is a tomb that's been cut in the rock for this wealthy man, Joseph of Arimathea. Okay? We're envisaging that it can form pretty much to the pattern of the garden tombs of wealthy Jewish chaps about the time of Jesus. There'd be an opening with a rock that rolled across in a channel of some sort, an oblong depression excavated inside the door, and cut into the side of that sort of oblong depression, they'd be like shelves onto which the bodies were laid, like racks. So, rock running down in channel against the aperture, so it rolled down, it'd be hard to move back up again against you know, preventing grave robbers. And then inside, something like this. Archaeological evidence leads us to think we'll be thinking about a scene that might have looked something like this, perhaps a little less spacious than the one on the wall in this artistic recreation, okay? The Bible's first readers wouldn't have needed this explained, obviously enough. They wouldn't have needed it explained that it was so across the door, you came down into this oblong bit in the middle and there'd be shelves on the side like that for the dead bodies to be laid on. They don't need that explained, they've got that already. John doesn't spell it out, but we need to spell it out, so there it is. Here comes what this explains. If the body is laid out on such a shelf in such a tomb, going in feet first, that would explain what we read. The other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, looked in at the strips of linen, so he's peering through the door. The strips of linen lying there didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him, went straight into the tomb, and he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head, the cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Now you only got to see the separate head cloth when you went on down into the tomb, in that little depression inside the door, because he's gone in feet first, the wrappings around the legs are there, but the head cloth he didn't see. Um, it was something like this. What they used to do was wrap the body up from the feet upwards to the shoulders kind of thing. And then the head would be wrapped separately. Peter goes straight in, John follows him afterwards, and also sees what's happened. But that's what we're talking about. We're talking about something that looks like that, that they saw, not something that looks like this. Not, uh, not you know, the coffin and we're getting Jesus out all wrapped up. None of that. Not sort of a, a, a wrapped up person picking himself up and trying to hop away from the grave. Uh, not neatly removed and wrapped and laid in one part of the, you know, like a big folded bed sheet. Not like that. Not zombie Jesus coming out, you know. Um, we're talking about this. This is what we're talking about. Why is that significant? Tight wrapping and binding, loads of spices wrapped in the folds. And what John seems to be telling us that both he and Peter saw was that the clothes had not been disturbed in any way except by the evacuation of the body from within them. Those grave clothes wouldn't be arranged like that if someone had revived and wrapped themselves or, or whatever else. Whatever else the resurrections are counted for sometimes when people want to get away from its, its historicity. There you go, there's the evidence of the grave clothes. That's pretty convincing to those guys fairly early on. But so far, all that anyone has seen is evidence that something really unusual has happened. John says at this point that he, but not Peter, believed, but that none of the disciples had yet understood that Jesus must fulfill scripture by being raised from the dead. Now look, here's an important point. All anyone has got so far is evidence. It's pretty convincing evidence. It's good evidence. But no one has met the risen Jesus. So, people could so far believe evidence that something very unusual has happened, but no one has yet believed in the risen Lord who had to rise from the dead to fulfill scripture and bring salvation. There's evidence, something's happened. But they haven't met with Jesus. So secondly, we've got to consider what happened later that first day in the week. That's early morning tombside, verses 1 to 9. Later, that same week, verses 10 to 18, Mary's in the garden. Her experience becomes rather different. Mary's alone in the garden. Well, not quite so alone as she thought she was. She just seems so much to be a woman alone with her grief in a graveyard. What we learn about Mary 
is that her grief is profound. We learn that with some emphasis in this passage. She's distraught at the disappearance of Christ's body. Verses 11 and 13 and 15, we're told she's weeping, she's weeping, she's weeping. Like so many grieving saints since, Mary, without knowing, has got angels in front of her and the Lord himself behind her. She just hasn't seen or recognised them. Now that's very often our experience, isn't it, when there are difficult times and troubling times and puzzling times and all the rest of it. We don't see or recognise. You know, this woman has got angels in front of her, she's got Jesus behind her and she doesn't, doesn't impinge. And her grief is intense because of that. She feels deserted, now Jesus is gone. She feels pitifully alone in the world, Jesus is gone. But when she meets Jesus, she realises she's not being left alone. Now, she has been immensely loyal. But she's been fixated on Christ's material body, his dead body. It had been very familiar to her over the course of three and a half years of his public ministry. But now she's got to let it go. She's got to let go of that issue, the material, physical body of Jesus. Look at verse 17. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Let go of that. Let go of that physical stuff. Go and say to my brothers and tell them I'm sending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary has met with the evidence for Christ's resurrection, the empty tomb and the collapsed grave clothes. And then she meets face to face with the angelic messengers who queried her weeping response, the things she was seeing. And then she hears from Jesus on the subject of her weeping, but doesn't recognise him because she'd not really looked at him. She thought he was the gardener. And finally, he called her name. And then she turned to him. And then she acknowledged his lordship. Then she came once more into contact with his transforming personality. It is the personality of Jesus that transforms people. It is meeting with him that transforms people. What's a Christian? See, we always reply, and there's truth in it, we always reply, a Christian is somebody who's turned from their sin and trusted Jesus. Or we say, a Christian is a person who believes this, 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 and this. We say those things. The Christian is those things, but the Christian is a person whose name has been called and who has themselves responded positively to Christ's life-transforming personality. See, the fundamental thing about Mary is this, is she's a sheep. She's a sheep. And sheep know their master's voice. John has run us through this already from chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, they know me. They follow me. And when Mary hears his voice, she turns and she recognises and then she believes in Jesus. You can believe that Jesus on the basis of all these other things we've been talking about so far. But believing in Jesus is a matter of having a voice called by the shepherd and responding like a sheep. This is really important. She's seen Jesus She's been gripped by the fact of his resurrection. She is so gripped she runs to tell the others. Mary Magdalene, verse 18, went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord! Oh no, this woman, she's lost in there. Poor woman, she's been grieving. Bonkers, we saw her in the grave, in, 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 the, in the cemetery, what's it called? Graveyard. There you go. We've seen her there. She was just off her head with grief. Ah, oh, yes, now come in, sit down, I have a cup of tea. Huh? Biscuit? Oh, come on, biscuit. Nice. You can just see it all going on, can't you? She is gripped. She runs to tell the others. She, she doesn't suddenly remember an alternative appointment elsewhere. She, she doesn't stop to consider what others will think of her if she makes telling others about the reality of the risen Jesus her priority in life. She doesn't say, hey, come on, it's Easter, give me a, give me a break. She's off on her toes, and we know from the other Gospels she gets a pasting for it from the disciples. They won't take her seriously. How discouraging is that when you get a pasting from the other disciples? 
but she still commits, now with good resurrection reasons, to serving the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and he's her priority, and continuing his mission is her priority, and his ministry continuing, that is still her absolute priority. Whoever is forgiven much loves much, and it's measured by the observable priorities across the face of Scripture. So let's see how Peter, John and the others are currently assessing their priorities in contrast with Mary Magdalene. Early morning, have done that. Later a.m., Mary in the garden, yep, saw that appearance on that first day of the week. Third appearance on the first day of the week, in the evening, behind locked doors, verses 19 to 23. It's now the evening of that same first day of the week. There have been three occurrences where Jesus has appeared on that first appointment with humanity after his resurrection. Evening of that first day of the week, those first set of resurrection appearances of the Lord have been taking place. How do things stand? The believers, the apostles, the twelve, the big men, future apostles, they're behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. Mary's racing round, shouting off a red that Jesus has been raised from the dead, but these guys are behind locked doors. Okay. They're locked away. Like most of the Christian church that's observable ever since. Afraid of their own version of what counts to them as the Jews. Locked away. Now these guys have heard the witness of Mary, verse 18, and they've had the evidence of the grave clothes, but they've only had the evidence of the grave clothes and the testimony of Mary. They haven't seen Jesus, and it isn't enough. Without a personal meeting of some description with the Lord Jesus. Now you can see how personal it is from what we've read about Mary already. You can see how fundamentally personalised it is in all sorts of accounts across scripture. It's different for everybody. But there's been some coming to get into grips with the risen Jesus. Personally. You can see how fundamentally necessary it is to authentic Christianity from the example of these disciples. Now what's going on in Jerusalem? Well, apart from them being behind locked doors, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is still going on in Jerusalem. The place is still buzzing. But they're not playing any part at all in it. They are behind locked doors, locked away, for fear of the Jews. And this is going to become their life-transforming moment. Jesus appears, verses 19b and 20. Here's how it goes. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Probably not the first thing they were thinking. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. See, they'd had the evidence, they'd had the testimony of Mary, but they were overjoyed when they saw the And again Jesus said, peace be with you. It's as if they must, they must have been a little perturbed in that room. You know, Jesus comes in and he's standing there and then somebody realises, didn't we lock the doors? How's this happened? And Jesus has to keep saying peace to them, peace to them. And they're overjoyed when they see him, but whoa, scary. Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you, says Jesus. And then verse 22, and with that he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Look, if you minister forgiveness of sins to people according to this gospel, you know, repent, believe, be baptised then those people also receive forgiveness of sins, as is testified to and evidenced by this resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because the thing that shows us that the, that the cross has worked is the resurrection. We saw that last time. The price is paid. Jesus is no longer subject to the penalty of sin. Death is gone. He's raised from the dead. If you minister forgiveness of sins to people according to this gospel, you'll be saying, repent, believe, be baptized. And those people receive forgiveness of sins, the resurrection shows so. What's being described here in these verses is not some medieval power play invention involving a box, a curtain and a man in a funny hat that Jesus... That's not what Jesus is talking about here. 
So it's not going to a priest, so-called, in some institution and getting some institutional forgiveness for your sins. He's talking about preaching and repentance and baptism and the forgiveness of sins, which is exactly how his hearers understood him, because that is exactly what they went away and did. They didn't go around building little boxes and putting on hats and having a curtain in it. What's Jesus got to say about it? He blesses them with peace. Peace with you. Peace with you. A peace the world cannot give. And they rejoiced with joy unspeakable and full of glory. They rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And he commissioned them to undertake his mission on earth. And he breathed on them the Spirit to empower them in that mission for the forgiveness of people's sins. Now, <clears throat> I can say to me, hang on a minute, because a few weeks later they were receiving the Spirit of Pentecost. Hmm. Two things going on. Firstly, here's the Messiah breathing on them and saying, go take the Spirit to take you on mission my mission in the world. Secondly, on the day of Pentecost, what happens is that the spirit of prophecy described by Joel is poured out on the worldwide people of God. Kind of different. The spirit comes, the different experience of the spirit is what's being talked about. Here we're talking about the mission empowerment part of the portion of the people of God. These twelve, these that have been with him, you go, and you take the testimony to the resurrection to the world. As my eyewitnesses, the eyewitnesses of my God. What characterised that resurrection community of the people of God right there on that first day? Let's have a look at that in conclusion. What characterised that bunch of people? Firstly, commitment to Christ, even if all that appeared or disappeared to be left was a body. Forgiven much, she loved much. Joy of experiencing the living presence of Jesus. Peace and joy in the blessing he gave. Commitment to his mission in their ongoing life as the people of God, the anointing of the Spirit to empower them for taking the news of the risen Jesus into a lost world for the forgiveness of sins. Those are the implications of that first appearance of Jesus in John's Gospel. So the question for everybody hearing, watching, wherever you're picking this up is, have you met with Jesus? That's the fundamentally life-changing thing in a Christian context. Met with Jesus. If Jesus is raised from the dead and he's for real, have you met with Jesus? It's what made all the difference for them. Obviously in this account he comes personally to individuals, walking through walls and failing to respect the integrity of your locked doors. But however it was for has he met you? Has he met with you? <clears throat> Maybe it's just my Twitter feed, but there's a bit of a tendency on my Twitter feed. The pastors of big churches around the place uh, to, to meet with and publish their photos being taken with celebrities. Uh, whatever that sort of celebrity that happens to be. You know, I've met this person, I've met this person, and there it is on Twitter, in, in the Twitter feed. But have, have you met with Jesus? Stick that on Twitter. That would be interesting. He comes personally. Walking through our walls. And our locked doors. But please do notice this. For all that we've said. These believers are not quite there yet. For a little while longer they're still stuck behind locked doors. And there is still more to come. Thomas has been in the wrong place. The body wasn't moving forward together. The body wasn't together. And it's going to have to be reunited before further progress is made. And God willing, that's what we'll be looking at next time in the second appearance of Jesus in John's Gospel, the second testimonial events to his resurrection.